Shalom everyone, this is uh, Danny Palmer here from Springfield, Missouri. Once again, uh, the teacher for a group called Yachad Kahal. Uh, this week's uh, coming Torah portion uh, is Ha-Azino, and it means here. Uh, it is Devarim 32. Uh, Devarim is the Hebrew. Uh, Deuteronomy is the Greek. Uh, the the uh, the Hebrew Devarim means the words, which is how uh, the the writing of Deuteronomy begins. These are the words that Moshe spoke to all Israel. The uh, Greek Deuteronomy means the second telling which is also an accurate name because it, see, he's telling the generation that uh, of those who perished who, because they would not go into the land the first time, he's telling them because some of them have not heard it yet. Uh, it is a summary. Uh, I like to call Deuteronomy uh, kind of like the condensed Reader's Digest form of the Torah as I refer to Revelations many times as the Reader's Digest condensed form of all the, all Scripture. So, and the Haftorah reading is Shemuel Beit, chapter 22, uh, in English, 2 Samuel. And I just thought, I didn't remember whether I mentioned that uh, it was Deuteronomy 32, the entire chapter. In both these cases, it's just one chapter the Torah and the half Torah portion. And this week, we're going to do a little changing. Uh, nothing about how we do it, but just uh, usually uh, the, the name I use is Yahweh. Uh, no problem with any other. Uh, I don't care if people use uh, Yehovah, Yahuwah. Uh, those don't make a difference to me because uh, in looking at those I haven't found uh, a negative and uh, that's what it's really based on. In fact, uh, those different uh, pronunciations of the ending tell us a little something different about the name. Now this week I'm going to be reading from a translation and I will be using the word Yehovah. So I just wanted to let those who know who believe that Yahuwah or Yahweh is the only way to say it. As I've mentioned this before many times, I really don't care which one you use. I am a proponent of using the name, but I am also a proponent that we don't make it so common that it becomes vain. That's what vain means. It's, it's, it's become so ordinary. Vain is not something that uh, means like evil. Vain means you, you make it so accessible that people lose the awe. So I don't have a problem with people who want to use uh, terms like uh, Adonai or Sovereign or Master or whatever so that they don't say them on a constant basis, constantly say Yahweh or Yehovah or Yahuwah or whatever. Uh, so, but I do believe in using it when you read scripture. If it's there, I think you ought to use it. I'm not going to condemn those who don't because maybe they just don't see it yet. Maybe he hasn't impressed it on their heart yet. So, let's be a little patient with, with ourselves and with our brothers and sisters out there. And... As I said, this week's portion is Devarim 32, or Deuteronomy chapter 32. And I'm going to read some select verses out of this. And you probably after each verse or small section of verses, I'm going to make a little comment as to why I chose to accent a focus on that particular verse. The first verse is, Give ear, O heavens, and let me speak, and let the earth hear the sayings of my mouth. Those of you who maybe this is your first time or you haven't seen some of the previous uh, videos that we've uh, made available, the heavens and the earth are what Moshe called to be a witness against Israel. Not in a negative way, 
to be, but to be a witness to say, okay, you agreed to the covenant. Heaven and earth are now your witness. That is why heaven and earth can never go away. They will be renewed. In our minds, we don't understand exactly how Yah is going to do that, but he's going to do it. We need to quit. If we're only focused on trying to figure out exactly how he's going to do something, we're going to drive ourselves crazy. We just need to trust that he's going to do it, and it's going to be way better than what we got now. That's the part I'm really looking forward to. Is things are going to be way better than they are now because we've made a mess of it as humanity. And I'm not just talking about the most current generations. I'm talking about ever since he created us and, the, and we first fell, we have been rebelling against him over all that time. Even, even in the times when we've tried to be more obedient, we've never been perfect. He's given us a system of how to repair that relationship with him. Before Yeshua, it was the sacrificial system. But everything had to go exactly the way Yah said. If the priest didn't do his part, your sacrifice didn't count. If you didn't bring it because you wanted your sin to be taken care of and it was your intention to change and not sin anymore, you just committed murder. The prophets said that over and over. If all you thought you had to do was kill an animal and sacrifice it, and that's all you had to do to get right with Yah, you did nothing but kill an animal, an innocent animal. Now, Yah gave us a purpose for those animals, that when we use it wrong, it was of no value to us, and we just took a life. We need to look at Yeshua in that same manner. You know, the one thing that Yeshua couldn't fail at, that the priests could fail at, the priests were supposed to do certain things on certain offerings. They were supposed to eat certain parts. They were to pr present everything in the proper order, in the proper amount, with the proper respect. Yeshua couldn't fail in that aspect because the offering he brought was himself. That's why he said, no man takes my life, I lay it down freely. The minute Yeshua fulfilled being the sacrifice, that sacrifice could never fail. But he didn't do it so that we could just go on sinning. Yeshua warned about that when he said, many will come in my name, proclaiming they're speaking in his words, or claiming to be doing his will, and they're not. And he said he will tell them, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And if you don't understand, there's one Hebrew word specifically, avodah. This word means work or worship. So in the Semitic or the Hebrew mindset, worship was work. It's what you do. It's not about what we think. Thinking leads to committing sin. That's why Yeshua warned that anybody who even holds a thought like that in their mind is committing that sin. Because you're killing somebody ahead of time. Or you're stealing from them ahead of time. You harden your heart when you continue to think like that. And it won't be long before you actually do commit one of those sins. Uh, now it, I'm going to move down to verses 4 and 5. The rock, perfect is his activity, for all his ways are justice. A L of faithfulness with whom there is no injustice, righteous and upright is he. They have acted ruinously on their own part. They are not his children. The defect is their own. A generation crooked and twisted. He tells us, Moshe is telling us, that Yah is the rock who is perfect, who is righteous. He cannot do wrong. 
Only we can. That's what he's telling us in verse 5. Guess what? The minute we do wrong, we break the covenant. I don't know if anybody's ever told you that. That's why we have to turn back to Yeshua. And through his sacrifice, we can make that relationship right with Yah, the Father. The Son is the advocate, the intermediary. There are many things we do not really understand because our minds are still clouded from the sin. We don't really really understand how to look at the Father and the Son and, and all the other aspects in the different ways that he describes himself through human beings who wrote it down in what we call the scriptures. You know, I see people getting hung up on trying to figure out exactly what the Son is, exactly what the Father is, exactly what the Ruach HaKodesh is. You know what? I'm not trying to figure out exactly what it is. He told me this is my character. When he gave us the Torah, this is my character, and if you want to be my people, this is supposed to be your character too. If we walk out in public and claim to be his and do not do what he said, we are liars, plain and simple. Our brother Yochanan wrote that. Anyone who says they know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. I think people need to start thinking about being liars because it says liars can't enter the city. What's a liar? Somebody who does something that he says not to, yet they say it's okay to do it. It says anyone who practices a lie that's why I stopped eating unclean meat. I grew up eating it, even though I, part of my ancestry is Jewish. We, we weren't observant. We ate pork. I ate shellfish. I even ate escargot once. <laughs> Fortunately, it had so much garlic in it, I don't really know what snail tastes like, thankfully. But those of you out there who are like me, who didn't come up in a traditional Jewish or Hebrew lifestyle of keeping the commandments, there's hope we can change. That's what it's about when he says, in the last days, especially in the last days, I will call my people. Guess what? The New Covenant, or the Renewed Covenant, says it is only with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. If you're still a Gentile, you're not in the covenant. Somebody's lying to you. You're either part of the olive tree or you're not. Shaul, our brother, wrote to the Roman congregation there telling them that the, that the branch doesn't feed the tree or the roots. The roots feed the branch. If you're not getting your food from the root, which is the Torah, you've got no food at all. You're not even where the woman wanting the demon cast out of her daughter was at. She at least knew where the scraps were and where the table was. And in her day, that was at the local synagogue where the Torah would be read every Shabbat. If you don't hear the Torah, how can you say you're his people? Because you don't even know how to be his people. I was in that boat. Even though I was brought up to read the Torah, that was one of the clues when I finally found out and, and, and my mother finally acknowledged that, yes, some of our heritage is Jewish. Uh, that comes from Germany. It wasn't Germany back at the time I great-grandparents left there. It was just a bunch of feudal little states. The, the cu current state of Germany, the nation, did not exist until 1870. Now the German people have been around for a long time. There's a difference between a, a nation existing with its own government and a, a people. 
And so, those who did not know this, and I did not know this till I read a book called The Pity of It All, written by a, a Jewish individual, uh, lamenting what happened in the Holocaust, and he was talking about how too many Jews missed it. Because they just couldn't fathom what was actually happening. Many went to the death camps, believing until the day they got to the camp. They were just being relocated. What many of them didn't realize is they were just being relocated to a cemetery. Assimilation is deadly. Those of us who are part of the house of Israel, and you're not in, if you're not part of the house of Israel or the house of Judah, where do you think you're going? That's my question to you. What's your hope? Shaul even talks about that. Those who were once outside the covenant. If you're, we all have to be in the same covenant. There's not two covenants. There's not, and now there are more than one covenant, but there's only one covenant that's covered by what Yeshua did. If you're not in that covenant, what are you counting on his sacrifice to pay the price for you for? You know, one of the one of the things that's nice about the internet is I can say things, not cruelly or meanly, but I can say things that somebody on the other side of the world can hear that never heard anybody ever speak it this way. I'm not here to feed you pablum or infant formula. If you're not moving up that ladder eating food, if you're still eating baby food, then how do you grow? Baby food is designed for babies. Our metabolism changes as we grow. There are things that I can't eat as much of as I could 15 or 20 years ago. My metabolism has changes. <clears throat> Excuse me there. Got a little tongue tied. But I can still eat those things, but I can't eat them to the degree that I used to eat them. There are things that I eat now that I couldn't stand when I was younger. When I was growing up, I hated cooked cabbage. Every time I'd smell my mother cooking it, oh, man. But now I even like Brussels sprouts. I grew up. My taste buds grew up. You know, uh, having smelled some of the uh, baby formulas I've uh, smelled that they give to children, I'm firmly convinced that they're must not be able to smell it because it smelled bad to me. <laughs> Anytime I've ever been around a woman who's making it for her child, I'm going, boy, they must have no taste buds and no sense of smell. <laughs> That's the only way I could see them tolerating that. So when you sit down at the table you sit at to get your bread, does it stink? Is it got any meat to it? If you're supposed to be an adult growing in him and in his will, why are you still eating Gerber or any other brand? Why aren't you up, up there eating your vegetables or your meat or whatever? Something you got to chew. You know, are you still toothless? He's true. Moshe told us that Yah himself spoke the words that he is not a man that he can lie. You know who the only thing that Yah ever said could lie is man. Now the adversary, the one we call Satan or the devil sometimes, is called the father of lies. But I challenge you to look all through scripture to find out if he actually told the lie himself or just deceived us into telling a lie to ourselves. To be the father of lies doesn't mean that the father has to lie. All he's got to do is to convince the children it's okay for them to lie. 
Now the next verse is verse 6. Is it to Yehovah that you keep doing this way, O people, stupid and not wise? Is he not your father who has produced you? He who made you proceeded to give you stability? Remember when Yeshua talks about the two builders. One built his house on sand and the other house built the house on a rock. You know anything about any kind of structure, and it doesn't have to be a house, but any structure that you want to stay somewhere, you don't build it on sand. Sand shifts with the wind or the water. Either one can move sand. The rock is where you want to put it. That's why they use concrete when they don't have rocks. They pour a foundation because there's not a rock to build directly on. The rock Yeshua is referring to is the coal rock. If you haven't built on the Torah, then you've got nothing but sand that you've built on that can shift at any time. Sand has a purpose in why it moves. You know, you can use sand to make concrete with, but you don't want to build just with sand because it won't stay together. It doesn't adhere. That's why you have to add other materials like lime and other things to it in order to make concrete. Who produced you? Did the Father that gave us his word produce you? Or did you or some other human being produce what you believe? And if it's not what the Father said, then it's a lie. That's why he told some of the Pharisees in one instant, your father is the devil. Because they twisted some of the things Torah said so it could agree with their particular philosophy. Now, I want to make a point here. One of the things I'm trying to do is educate people on some things that they don't seem to know. Did you know that there wasn't just one mindset among the Pharisees? That's why they chose who taught them. They didn't all agree with each other. Around the time uh, period that Yeshua lived were a couple of uh, famous rabbis called the Shammai and Hillel. Uh, Shammai was a very stern man, the letter of the law kind of guy. Hillel was a, a little more loosening. So I have heard some of the, uh, the uh, Messianic Jewish teachers, the, the rabbis, uh, compare that they believe that you can go to different situations where Yeshua is addressing a group of Pharisees who's questioning him and you can almost tell which teacher they followed by the way that they challenged Yeshua. So there was not just one mindset. As I said, the, uh, the Pharisees in many ways would, would be uh, almost the equivalent of today's college professor or school teacher. That's what they did. That's what rabbis did. They went around and taught. Some of them had uh, full time at, at, at a synagogue. Others traveled around a region where they uh, had their disciples who followed them around. And one of the interesting things is the rabbi took care of the disciples, not the disciples, the rabbi. That's why Yeshua kept telling his disciples, don't, don't worry about stuff. You're my disciple. You're my Talmudim. I'm your rabbi. I'll take care of you. You come to study under me. It's my responsibility to give you the bread that nourishes the body and the bread that nourishes the soul. Verse 8. When the Most High gave the nations an inheritance when he parted the sons of Adam from one another. He proceeded to fix the boundary of the peoples with regard for the number of the sons of Israel. Oh, he's saying here that every people on the earth has been given a place. Doesn't that dispute what a lot of people have been taught? That you're either here or you're out. 
Christ. It never says that in Torah. It never says that anywhere. Yeshua never said that. Every people has an inheritance. So if you're in a place and you're calling yourself Israel or you're grafted into Israel, and I'm talking about the 12 tribes, not just the house of Israel or the house of Judah. I'm talking about if you're saying you're grafted into the 12 tribes, because you can't be grafted into just one. If you're grafted into the house of Judah, you're grafted into the house of Israel. If you're grafted into the house of Israel, you're grafted into the house of Judah. It's all one tree. To those of you who cringe when people call you a Jew, even though you're not, don't get mad at them. And there's nothing wrong with you. Just somebody wants to explain to you, well, I'm not Jewish. I just follow the Torah. Quit feeling like they've called you a name or something. <laughs> like they've ridiculed you. Many in the in the in the, in, the, in what consider themselves the house of Israel need to quit holding the Jews in such contempt. They have as many problems as we do. But guess what? He didn't divorce them. He divorced us. That's why he died. So that he could remarry Israel. And he could put us and Judah back together. Two sticks crossed. The sign of the covenant. So if you're not laying claim to be in either affiliated with Judah or with Israel, you're not in that covenant. It clearly says so. You don't believe me? Read Jeremiah 31 and, and, and Hebrews 8. And read everything that Yeshua and the disciples all said. They never disputed there was only one covenant with Israel. You can say that there was only one covenant, but there's only one covenant with Israel. Verse 9, for Yehovah's share is his people. Yaakov is the allotment that he inherits. Oh, the 12 tribes are his inheritance. He told us so. We're the inheritance. Our problem is we can't seem to fathom that's a good thing. <laughs> that our creator wants to claim us as his inheritance. Now I've noticed throughout my life, even before I began to try to keep Torah myself, is how many times people would focus on a certain verse or chapter or even a book in scripture completely ignore one of the others instead of trying to put them all together and figure out okay what are they all saying together they want one to stand alone now I was sharing with the, the, the people in our group that you had call now there's one book I like to call the book of salvation and it particularly relates to the house of Israel and they looked at me because they weren't stopping to think either because it didn't dawn on them. I was talking about the book of Hosea. Now that's just a little inside thing with us because if you understand, Hosea means salvation. That is, Hosea is the same name as Moshe's right-hand man. It's not Hosea and Hosea. They're both the same name in Hebrew. There's not a difference. That's why Moshe added part of Yah onto the front of Hosea's name so that Hosea or Yehoshua or Yahusha, would, his name would say, Yah is salvation. That's why Yeshua, which is another form of the same name. Uh, I believe I mentioned uh, a few weeks back that Yeshua seems to be more derived, the way we pronounce it, is from the Aramaic. Uh, Shu is, is uh, basically what the Aramaic sounds like. 
And I believe that uh, because the, even the Jews, uh, in the periods that the, uh, the, the Peshitta, the, uh, those who believe that Yeshua is Messiah, the Aramaic translation, as opposed to the Targums, which were basically the uh, Jewish uh, translations or interpretations that were based on the rabbinic ideas, uh, I believe the name Yeshua probably became common in that time period. Uh, sometime between uh, the year 100 and 800 or somewhere you know within that time frame because uh, in Hebrew it's probably more likely it's Yahshua with a more of the uh, Hebraic A sound because they don't pronounce A the same way we do in English and so we're, we're his inheritance so are we, we trying to give him a Raw deal. Oh, you're stuck with me. I get to act any way I want. I'm your inheritance. You're stuck with me. I called on your name. I used the magic formula. That's all I had to do. Come into my heart. Oh, don't change my heart. Just come in. What good's that? Yeshua said, if we will abide in him, then he and his father would abide in us. That's in John 14. How's he going to abide in us if we don't abide in him? How do we abide in him? I don't get to keep doing what I want if I want to abide in him. He told me he did only what his father did. He didn't speak his words. He spoke his father's words. How dare we go around saying we can live differently than Yeshua and still be his and we can speak a different message and say we're proclaiming the same message that Yeshua spoke. Friends, we're in the Akarit Hayyamim, the last days, the end of the age. It's not the end of the earth. It's the end of an age. And now verses 15 through 27. When Yeshurun began to grow fat, then he kicked. You have grown fat. You have become thick. You have become gorged. So he forsook El, who made him, and despised the rock of his salvation. They began inciting him to jealousy with strange Elohim. With detestable things, they kept offending him. They went sacrificing to demons, not to Elohim. Elves whom they had not known, new ones who recently came in, with whom your forefathers were not acquainted. The rock who fathered you, you proceeded to forget, and you began to leave Elohim out of memory. The one bringing you forth with childbirth pains. When Jehovah saw it, then he came to disrespect them because of the vexation his sons and his daughters gave. So he said, let me conceal my face from them. Let me see what their end will be afterward. For they are a generation of perverseness, sons in whom there is no faithfulness. They, for their part, have incited me to jealousy with what is no L. They have vexed me with their vain idols. And I, for my part, shall incite them to jealousy with what is no people. With a stupid nation, I shall offend them. For a fire has been ignited in my anger, and it will burn down to Sheol, the lowest place, and it will consume the earth and its produce, and will set ablaze the foundations of mountains. I shall increase calamities upon them, my arrows I shall spend upon them. Exhausted from hunger they will be, and eaten up by burning fever, and bitter destruction, and the teeth of beasts I shall send upon them with the venom of reptiles of the dust. Outdoors a sword will bereave them, and indoors fright of both young man and virgin, suckling together with gray-haired man. I should have said, I shall disperse them. I will make the mention of them cease from mortal men, were it not that I was afraid of vexation from the enemy, that their adversaries might misconstrue it, that they might say, 
our hand has proved superior, and it was not Jehovah who has worked all this out. Those of you who are looking at the current situation that's going on in the Middle East, or what's going on between Russia and the Ukraine, or any other conflict that's going on right now, and thinking, hey, we can solve this. This isn't Elohim. This is just happening. You know, every one of these areas are very critical to the story that we're told throughout Scripture. You better keep your eyes on Turkey. There's going to be some major things come out of there. You know, the Russians would like to get their hands on Istanbul. Because to a huge degree, the Russian mindset is they are the rightful heirs to the Roman Empire. When I found that out, I go, wow, that explains why the ruling family called themselves the Romanovs. It explains why they called their leader a czar. And, and because I go, why has Russia always been interested in that strait there that separates the Black Sea from the Mediterranean? Istanbul or ancient Constantinople spans that and they control Russia's access in and out of the Mediterranean. It's Russia's only warm water ports. That's why the uprising happened in the Crimea that began this current turmoil with the Ukraine. And those who think that the Ukraine has no problems, the Ukrainians sided with the Nazis in World War II. There was at least one death camp in the Ukraine. I'm not trying to lambaste anybody, but I'm, I'm just trying to inform you that everything you see may not be what you think it is. Do we really want to ally ourselves with Iran? Are they any better than ISIS? Especially anybody who has any Jewish ac 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 ancestry. I'm <laughs> tongue tied again there, I'm sorry. If you got any Jewish ancestry or you love your Jewish brothers, why would you favor Iran over ISIS? And I'm not saying I favor ISIS either. I don't. Iran has outright said their goal would be to eventually eliminate the state of, of the Jews called Israel. How many of you ever stop and think about how many times that Yah warns us in Scripture that what, what the enemy would like to do was fix it where Israel is no longer remembered as a people. You know, right now, our Jewish kinsmen are the only ones who definitely know any of their ancestry. They're the key to Israel not being forgotten. Oh, those of you who don't think the Jews have any place in the picture, boy, if the Jews are gone, who remembers Israel? Because even Israel doesn't remember Israel. How many of you, when you came out, even were aware that the house of Israel and the house of Judah weren't the same thing? We were until after Shlomo, Solomon, but since that time, we've not been unified. We've actually been fighting wars against each other. I guarantee you some of the Nazis were Israel in their genetic ancestry. You know, it warns about coming up into the last days that Ephraim and Manasseh would be fighting against each other. How many of you know that one of the groups, especially East Manasseh, is heavily, heavily represented by the Gaelic descended people? Oh, look at England and its problems with the Irish and the Scottish and the Welsh throughout the history of the United Kingdom. Because it's two brothers who can't get along. It even warns us that eventually, even though they're not united, They'll strike out against Judah. Oh. 
Israel is not a happy place, and I'm talking to all ten tribes. <laughs> it's not. A, it's not. It's not this peaceful pot of loving family. And those of you who are uh, looking so sternly on what's going on in the Middle East, how do you know it's not Yah letting it happen? I mean, the verses I just read from 15 through 27 said, I'll turn my back on you and let these things happen to you because you, ins and he says it over and over and over. In the Torah alone, let alone when we get to the prophets. The prophets kept telling us over and over and over. He will turn his back. He won't go away, but he'll turn his back. Because we've got to go to his face. He doesn't have to come to ours. Now, an interesting word there at the beginning of verse 15 is Yeshurun. This is uh, derived from the same root as where we get the word Yashar, upright. Uh, there's two references, one in uh, Joshua and one in Samuel, to a recording called the Book of the Upright or the Book of Yashar or the Book of Jasher. Now, there's been quite some speculation over history. Is Was this actually a book or was it another way to refer to one of the books of the Torah or the Torah as a whole? I don't know. Because to this day, my understanding is they've not been able to find anything that called itself the book of Yashar that contained the two things that Joshua and Samuel both said that the book of Yashar would contain information about. Now, there are a few writings called the book of Yashar, uh, and <coughs> I would just say if you read those, read them with a grain of salt. Uh, they're just li like any of the extra biblical writings, uh, like the Apocrypha or, or the Pseudepigrapha or those others, uh, you know, you read Enoch or Jubilees or whatever. Uh, the book of Jubilees is an interesting one. Uh, we are going to, uh, I've read it twice myself, and uh, as we begin in Bereshit, as we begin the Torah cycle again, uh, our little group here is going to also study uh, the similarities and differences that are contained in the book of Jubilees between uh, the book of uh, Bereshit, Genesis, and Shemot, Exodus. There are a couple interesting things that uh, seem to play out that the, the Yovel or the Jubilee cycle isn't 50 years, but maybe 49. It always occurs on the 50th year, and it's like Shavuot. You count 49 days, and the 50th is Shavuot. Yovel or Jubilee according to the Book of Jubilees, seems to follow the same pattern. It would make perfect sense. It's the same pattern that we get when we get to Sukkot. The eighth day is not part of Sukkot, but it's a closing for Sukkot. And so the eighth, as in a new beginning, okay, at Shavuot, whether you observe it the way that our Jewish kinsmen do or whether you are uh, observing on the first day of the week like the, the Karaites and many of the Hebrew roots people do uh, on a first day of the week, regardless of it, which way you do it, the 50th is not a cycle all by itself. It's based on counting seven sevens. 7 times 7 is 49. Uh, another little interesting tidbit on, uh, on numerical things. Uh, Yah told Yermayahu that the house of Yehuda would go into punishment or captivity in Babylon for 70 years. And he tells us exactly how Yah determined that 70 years is Judah, Yehuda, had neglected at least 70 times to live up to the Yovel or Jubilee. Oh! 
but uh, right now uh, 7 is an oath number. Yeah, I said 70 years. You're going to spend 70 years. Now, they finished that up in Persia. And the Persians are the one that sent them back home. Now, those who, of you who are under the misinformed idea that all Judah was taken to Babylon, no, it was only the leadership and the rich. The poor were left behind. And so, it took 490 times that the seventh year was ignored to get to that 70. And isn't it interesting that uh, the Pharisees or Sadducees, one, I can't remember which one it is, an incident, they came to Yeshua asking, how many times do you forgive somebody? And Yeshua told them they were wrong. And then Kepha asked Yeshua, well, well, how many should it be? Should it be seven times, 70? I can't remember exactly which figure he used, but Yeshua said, no, it would be 70 times 7. Oh, 70 times 70 is 490. Was Yeshua saying, remember why Judah had to go to Babylon? Because it didn't forgive debt. It's not about not sinning. It's not that they didn't forgive debt and they didn't let the land rest. Forgiveness more times than anything in Scripture is about forgiving a brother's debt. You know who the sinner is in the scenario when the debt's not forgiven? It's not the one that owes, it's the one who won't forgive. He said, you're my people. If I've blessed you and you forgive your brother's debt, you have nothing to worry about. I'm going to meet your need. Don't worry about it. But you're going to be the method that when he leaves, you're going to get him back on his feet so he can leave. You're not just going to say, hey, your debt's free, Claire, go on. Oh, and you've got nothing, but guess what? Guess what's going to happen to you? you got nothing, you're going to end up in the same state that you just left. <laughs> you're going to fall into bondage to me or somebody else. How many times has somebody owed you something and you weren't willing to forgive it, even when you knew they'd never be able to return it? It doesn't mean we never get irritated or angry. But when we let that irritation or anger fester so that we don't forgive, that's when the sin really kicks in. You know, that Yeshua got up in the synagogue in Nazareth and read from Isaiah 60. I don't know how many of you know that, He's speaking of the forgiveness of the Jubilee year. The acceptable year. The year of forgiveness. The year that property returns. That's one of the differences between the Jubilee year and the seventh year. Is property must be returned in the Jubilee. The individual is freed after seven. But property has to be returned to its original owner. Remember what I said about the nations? If Israel tries to claim any place they want in the world, Israel's moving a boundary marker. Just as much as if the nations try to deny Israel its birthright. Guess what? Uh, Judah has no claim to the land under the birthright. It only holds the scepter. The birthright belongs to Ephraim. He's going to bring us back together because he's made the system where we need each other. Why do we not possess all the areas that he promised us? Because we're a house divided. The house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, I'm not saying that our Jewish kinsmen should get out of the land. That is not what I'm saying at all. In fact, as I've mentioned uh, a couple weeks back, we better 
be praying for our brothers in that because they're paying a price to hang on to something that belongs to all of us. How many of us are over there right now fighting for that? Trying to keep the inheritance. In fact, some of Israel is telling Judah to give up land. Because you're stupid. You're saying, take the birthright. Let's get rid of the covenant. You've seen the claim that you've returned, trying to return to the covenant. But if you say that the land can be divided, it belongs to him. And he said, I've assigned it to the sons of Jacob. A promise first began to Abraham. And I'm going to kind of wrap up this chapter with verse uh, 36. For Jehovah will judge his people and he will feel regret over his servants because he will see that support has disappeared and that there is only a helpless and worthless one. Oh, those of you who believe that because you've become his people in, in whatever format you think that was that you became his people and so now you're not going to have any judgment. Man, have you got a big surprise coming. <laughs> Because judgment comes either in our favor or against us. Judgment's coming no matter what. We're either going to get a good judgment because we've trusted and Yeshua's price that he paid is going to cover for our shortcomings or what else will we have? A completely negative verdict. You know, I know in my own life I'm depending real heavy on my shortcomings being made up by Yeshua, not because I don't think I need to try to obey, but because I know I fail. And that doesn't mean I don't know what to do to get back up. Because you know what? He never told us all we had to do was say a prayer. There's no validation for that ever in Scripture. If I confess my sins, that means I'm supposed to stop sinning. Now, since there's a, this period we're in, this coming weekend is Yom Kippur. No matter which calendar you're using, it's coming up this weekend. <laughs> and we're not disputing on one day or the other because... It's the different ways that people look at the, 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 uh, the, the moon, uh, whether they look for the swivel or, or they look for the uh, conjunction. And that's usually a day apart. Now, curiously, on uh, Yom Teruah that just passed over this weekend, uh, or leading right into the weekend, uh, uh, they merged. From all the information that I've been able to uh, acquire, they occurred at the same time, which doesn't usually happen. Usually they're about a day apart. But regardless of whether it's the seventh day of the week coming up at the end of this week or the first day of next week, people will be observing Yom Kippur. And those who do not understand because you think that Yeshua was only the Pesach lamb or the Passover lamb. Okay, you've got no forgiveness of sin if all he was was the Passover lamb. Passover lamb has nothing to do with forgiveness of sin. If you never heard that, boy, you better do some studying. The Passover lamb has nothing to do with forgiveness of sin. It's about salvation. Being saved from Egypt. Being spared the death angel. To protect your firstborn son and the firstborn male of your livestock. You know, there's an interesting thing in Torah. You're the firstborn of your mother. But you get all your inheritance and your ancestry from your father. Jacob's firstborn was Reuben. 
of his wife Leah. And he lost some face because he perpetrated an act. Uh, Jacob's favorite son was Joseph because his wife that he loved the most was Rachel. But Rachel was a little headstrong. And there's a, probably a reason that Yaakov uh, chose Rachel over Leah. It's never saying that Leah wasn't desirable at all. I think uh, Yaakov chose uh, Rachel because they were opposites. I think Rachel was a lot like uh, Yaakov's mother, Rivka. I think Yaakov was a lot like his father. You know, there is a degree of opposites attract. Because I think in these instances, uh, it's not that uh, Yitzchak or Yaakov were weak men. It's just in certain areas they needed someone who would push them a little. And I, I believe that's what Rivka and Raquel did for uh, Yitzchak and Yaakov. Uh, but Raquel was a little more headstrong, apparently, than Rivka. Uh, Rivka, her favorite son was Yaakov. And I think it says a lot about Rivka. I think it says how much she loved Isaac because she favored the son that was most like her husband. And I think it also shows how much Yitzchak loved Rivka because his favorite son was the one that was most like his wife in their personality, in their character. Strong, strong willed, determined. And everybody has their flaws. But have you ever stopped and thought about that, though? Is a man who's quiet, weak, or is he strong in ways that you don't recognize? So, the question is, which parent do you favor? I'm referring to the parents I just mentioned, Yitzchak and Rivka, and Yaakov and Rachel. Are you the warmonger? Or are you the peacemaker? The interesting thing that Yeshua said is, I did not come to bring peace but a sword. But he didn't say literally to go out with a sword and kill. He said he would cause conflict because of those who would keep his Torah and those who were opposed to his Torah. I came to set father against son, mother against daughter. How many of you come to Torah and you've got family? Maybe even a spouse or your own children your best friends who cut you off or deride you and mock you and, 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 and they believe you've lost your way because you began to see what the truth is in Scripture. I can't follow Yeshua and not try to do Torah. Yeshua didn't die so I could go out and be a murderer. Oh, well, I'm not a murderer. Well, so I won't be a thief. Oh, I'm not a thief. So I can go out and eat pork. So I can go out and call any day I want Shabbat. Now, you can worship as many times as you want in a week. There's no rule about that. But there's only one day of the week that Shabbat. And that began at creation. And on the seventh day, Yah rested from all his work. Shabbat was created for the human being. Oh, he was just created the day before. The sixth day. Or it was created the day before. The human being. 
because the human being doesn't become male and female until the end of chapter 2. Those of you who are reading it in English translation, the word man is a very inappropriate translation in the entirety of Genesis chapter 1. It would be a better translation to say humanity or mankind or human being. Uh, ish is the most common Hebrew word for male. Isha, female. And the Isha also many times refers to a wife. And so if two men, Yitzchak and Yaakov, father and son, were very similar in their character and their personality, they weren't weaklings. They were both men of peace. Yaakov had a little uh, problem because uh, he let himself get pushed into things by his mother. And I'm not calling Rivka evil because she knew that Yaakov was supposed to be the son. I think the problem comes in in the way she carries out how that gets handed down to Yaakov. Uh, those of you who are looking at the situation with ISIS and uh, Al-Qaeda and other groups around the Middle East, uh, oh, we've got to destroy them. We've got to kill them. How do you know that they're not today's Assyria and Babylon to bring judgment to Israel and Judah? Not to destroy us, but to get us to open our eyes and really start walking in Yah's way. He told us he would do that. How do you know that's not what he's doing right now? And I know some of you are not going to like this, but I think he's going to bring this country, the United States, to its knees. Hopefully in repentance. Because this is not a righteous nation. Our kinsmen in, 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 in Israel right now, the Jews, they're, they're not righteous either. But they don't have the same problems this nation has. You know, if you're grafted into the tree, you become Israel. You can't still be a Gentile. Because a Gentile is somebody who's not in the covenant. And I'm going to read a, a verse here in uh, Leviticus 16, which is uh, chapter 16, is one of the two chapters that is uh, traditionally read on Yom Kippur. Uh, chapter 16 is talking about all the, the aspects of what is to be done with the bulls and the two goats. And verse 5 says, And from the assembly, assembly of the sons of Israel, he should take two male goat uh, kids for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. From the assembly of the sons of Israel. Not from the Gentiles. From the sons of Israel. Okay. And these sacrifices have to be declared, especially on Yom Kippur, by the high priest, to meet all the requirements that Yah said. Okay. Whether or not Caiaphas and his, those around him were legitimately priests, they declared Yeshua to be clean. They disagreed with him, but they presented him as a sacrifice. Kill him. Okay, how many of you ever stopped and thought about who killed him? Yeshua said, no man. I lay my life down freely. In fact, Pontius Pilate does not have a good reputation historically as being a merciful man. 
But in this particular instance with Yeshua, he seems uh, kind of like he's trying to wash his hands of the situation. Why, why are you bringing this to me? This has nothing to do with the empire. This is not affecting the empire at all. This is an internal squabble among you Jews. Why are you bringing this to me? Well, whether anybody realized it or not, they had to be brought to Pilate so that Pilate could also declare him clean. I find no fault in him. Why? Because the priest never brings the offering on his own behalf except on Yom Kippur. And that's only the high priest who brings a bull for his own sin. Is Yeshua ever referred to as the bull? He's referred to as the lamb or the scapegoat or the, the sin goat or any of those aspects. He's never referred to as the bull. Why? Because he's the high priest. But the, but the high priest who is standing in the office of high priest has sent him to the Roman governor. And the Roman governor says, hey, I find nothing wrong with him. And okay, we'll kill him because you just won't let us out of this. We really want nothing to do with it because he hasn't done anything wrong as far as the empire is concerned. Barabbas over here, on the other hand, we've got every reason to put him to death. But you decided you want me to free him instead of Yeshua. And the people said, let his blood be upon our head. Did you know that in Exodus, when Moses presented the covenant to Israel, he sprinkled the blood over the people. The blood was on their head. They had accepted the covenant. Let his blood be upon our heads. They didn't even realize they were once again accepting the covenant. But Yeshua himself kept saying, I came only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, if a priest has declared the sacrifice to be legitimate, meets the criteria, and a priest is not a religious official, a priest is a government official. He represented Yah and the system that Yah gave us to atone for our sins. It's like paying our fine or serving our time. The priest representing Rome was a man named Pontius Pilate. Because the priest is not a religious official. He's a government official. Have you ever stopped and thought, especially those who believe you're Israel, that Pilate represents the house of Israel? Who needed the sacrifice? The house of Israel. I find no fault in him. He, he's done nothing wrong. Oh, that means I just declared he's a legitimate sacrifice. You ever stopped and thought about it that way? Okay, if you're claiming he's your Messiah and you're laying claim to the covenant, you know you're saying his blood is upon my head. And every time we Go against the covenant. We're saying, okay, sacrifice yourself again. Didn't Shaul warn against that mindset? Because if you are not from the house of Israel, you don't have a sacrifice to present. And, and I'm talking in this sense all 12 tribes. He had to be presented by all 12 tribes. But the one that needed him the most is the house of Israel. Remember earlier in the video, you saw me do my hands and arms like this. 
you know that's the ancient way with the letter Tav left. It looked like X sometimes. Sometimes it looked like what we think of as a T. Okay, if you believe he was hung on a stake, you should be saying the letter Tav every time. And the letter Tav is a sign of the covenant. One of our previous videos we, we called X marks the spot. X marks the sign of the covenant. We're either in the covenant that Yeshua presented, which is the same one Moshe did, or we're not. And we're either playing games, or we're not. Either Yeshua is my sacrifice, or I don't have one, period. Because the system is no longer in place to allow a human priest to present bulls and goats. Oh, and those of you who have never heard this before, I'm going to ask you an interesting question because I want you to look it up for yourself. How is Yeshua my sin sacrifice individually when the Torah says my individual sin sacrifice must be a female? I want you to ponder that. As communally, it's a male. But individually, it's required to be a female. I want you to think. I know how. But I want you to think about that. I'm not going to tell you. Because you've you got to get this on your own. Because if I tell you, it might just drive you away. You're going to think he's some kind of nut. But you've got to let the Ruach show you how he's our individual sacrifice. Because it's going to shock you. And you're either going to receive it or you're going to reject it. In your mind and in your heart. This is why Gnosticism is a complete hoax. It's full of crap. The Gnostics believe that we need to escape this world because this physical world is evil. Yah said it's good. Yah said everything he created was good. He didn't create us to sin, but he allowed us to choose whether we would obey or sin. We're doing that every day. Those of you who think that you've got this locked in no way I can do anything wrong. Mental idea. I don't know what Bible you're reading. I don't know what scripture you're reading. It isn't there. He said, if you love me. Love is not an emotion. Love is an action. I'm not saying there's no, no emotion to love, but in the Semitic mindset, love is what you do. It's how you treat somebody. Hate is how you treat them. How many of you women or men have heard your wives or whatever make a comment like, he never shows me he loves me. It's always just words. It's always just feelings. There's no tangible act. All the areas, you know I love you. No, they want some action that says, I know you love me because this is how you treat me. You know what hatred is? It's the exact opposite of love. If a man's wife says, if you love me, honey, we take out the garbage on a regular basis. And he says yes. And he takes it out every day. He's saying, I love you. I respect you enough. I told you I would do it. I'll do it. And I'm just using a simple thing. But you know what hate would be? Yes, I'll do it. And then he never does it. He's holding her in complete contempt. 
you know, in uh, the festival of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, whatever name you've probably heard it referred to. Outside of the, uh, the Torah and the Half Torah and the uh, Brit Hadashah sections, traditionally among our Jewish kinsmen, at some time during Sukkot, they will read the entire book of Ecclesiastes. You know, he's very much had several verses on my mind in, in the first eight verses of Ecclesiastes 3 is because of a personal thing I'm going through in my own life, and I don't want to mention it, but there's a, a few different verses he's had me pondering, and it has to do with patience. Let's don't jump the gun. Uh, let's not assume that because we think an action needs to happen right now that the only way it's going to happen is if we force the action. That's not what he said. In fact, David talks about a time, this is one of the other verses that he impressed on me out of Psalm 46, and it's David talking about a time that he's uh, in a conflict. Um, very good chance that uh, Psalm 46 is talking about a time when you know he was fleeing from Saul. And the verse is, uh, Be still and know that I am Elohim. But sometimes he wants us to show our faith by not acting, and other times we have to show it by acting, and we need to trust him and say, okay, what am I supposed to do this time? Am I supposed to refrain from acting, or am I supposed to act? Refraining is an action of its own. Waiting isn't something we're real crazy about. Especially the, things, the way the things are in the world right now. Oh, man, boy, I sure will be glad when he sets up the kingdom and everything's the way it ought to be. But what's the kingdom? He's not the kingdom. And what did he say his kingdom was going to be? His kingdom, a kingdom, is a place where there are rules. Many people are familiar with the passage in Isaiah that's quoted in the Brit Hadashah about the coming of the Messiah out of Isaiah. But how many of them want to actually believe what it says? Because, you know, curiously, uh, Yeshua Yahu, again, one of the chapters, uh, I believe it's 53, with who has believed our report? He's talking about himself and the other prophets. Who has believed our report? Guess what? In their day, nobody was believing it. But one of the things that Yeshua Yahu says is, and of the increase of his government, there should be no end. There's always going to be rules. All of eternity. The increase of his government doesn't mean there's going to be more rules. It says there's going to be more to govern. The increase of his government. In, in the Revelation, Yohanan says he one of the last things he's shown is the new Yerushalayim. And it's called the Bride, the city. Once again, what's a city? A city is not buildings. A city is people. And it says she's been washed white. Yes. You know, at least three times, just off the top of my head, in the Revelation, it talks about wearing white garments. And one time specifically, it talks about their garments are white because they've washed them. How do you wash them? Those of you who come from a Christian background, there's an old song called Washed in the Blood. 
Or you washed in the blood, and then you went out and soiled your garment again? Because as I said, there's no such thing as, I can't sin, or my sin doesn't count. In fact, he warned us, that's what we do in the last days. Moshe told us that. He said, for the time will come when you'll basically pat yourself on the back and say, my sin don't count. Guess what? Sin always counts. There's a way to take care of it. He's always given us a way to take care of it. And it's always cost something that's life. Where did the skins for Adam and Chava, Eve, come from? Yah doesn't do magic. He gave them skins instead of the fig leaves, which he said wouldn't cover them. Why did the garments cover them? The skins. Because something died and blood was shed. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. What covenant are you declaring you're in? Because you're declaring and I'm declaring what covenant we're in. And is he in agreement with that covenant that we're declaring? He told us the instructions, which is one of the meanings of the word Torah. Instruction. Do you give instruction? And then expect somebody to do something completely different than what the instructions had? No. How many wives can say, well, my husband started putting together a, an assembly uh, that we bought, and he got frustrated and actually had to go back and read the instructions. Because <laughs> he tried to do it without the instructions. You know what I mean? Hey, I've been guilty of doing it once or twice myself that I can recall. I probably did it more than that, but I know at least once or twice that, that I can recall on the top of my head. That I thought, well, this is not going to be that hard. It's not going to be so hard to figure out exactly how to do this. But something always come up in the process of the assembly that you go, wait a second. I either don't have enough or I've got too much. Yeah, I did follow one instruction at the very beginning that said, make sure all these parts are here, and I did. But I didn't go any farther with the instructions and tried to assemble it. Well, they're all here, so let's go. Yeah, this goes here. This go, wait, wait a minute. Uh, how come I've got too many or not enough? <laughs> What's missing here? <laughs> how many of you seen the commercial where the guy builds the uh, above ground pool and he uh, doesn't put the screws in? <laughs> and the next thing you see, the sides just collapse. And the, the idea of a commercial is a joke that you wouldn't do that. The idea of the commercial was that you either do one or the other. Well, they decided not to put the screws or bolts in, whatever it was, but they did the other. <laughs> Same thing with Torah. Same thing with what you should do. He said, if you love me, then keep my commandments. He didn't say, if you love me and you want to, then keep my commandments. He said, the sign that you love me is you keep my commandments. You know what? If we say we don't have to keep his commandments, you know what we're saying? I hate you. I have complete contempt for your ways. But you're my Savior. You're my Redeemer. But I hate you. I'm not going to do that. I don't have to. You've already paid the price. You can't make me. Na, 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 na. And I guarantee you there's not, not a single person who hasn't done that sometime in their life. And they didn't even know they were doing it. I've done it. Before I really understood. Oh! If I love him, then I'll do this because I love him. That's how I'll show him I love him. I won't eat pork. I won't eat shellfish. I won't commit adultery. I won't 
hate my neighbor. Now the other verse of uh, I told you there's basically three uh, sections of uh, scripture that you know I had on my heart for a while. Like I said, it was dealing with an issue that I'm dealing with in my own personal life. The first one was really uh, something that I was falling into, and uh, it's Leviticus 19:18. Now, most of you, if I ask you what Leviticus 19.18 was, you know, Tori, you'd probably be able to tell me, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's only half the verse. It's the other half that I was having the problem with, that I was guilty of. It's the part that says, you shall not take vengeance nor bear a grudge against the children. I wasn't seeking vengeance. And I was falling into bearing a grudge because something that I wanted to happen, I thought, was being denied me. I was guilty. And there's a reason why he kept reminding me, not of, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself, but you can't love your neighbor as yourself if you take vengeance or bear a grudge. It's impossible to love somebody and try to take vengeance or bear a grudge. So be very careful with what you're thinking about that's going on in the Middle East right now. What's going on in Russia and the Ukraine. Be very careful. Is it love or is it hate? The Jews weren't really fond of the Samaritans because they just considered them a bunch of pagans. That's why they didn't like to go there because they thought every time they went there it would make them unclean. Because they didn't follow the same practices that the Jews did. That's one of the reasons why the Samaritan woman was surprised when Yeshua spoke to her. She knew he was a Jew by the way he looked. What? How did he look? I can't give you the exact details, but I guarantee you she immediately knew. He spoke to her, and she immediately knew he was a Jew. But guess what? It couldn't have been because of his language, because he grew up in the Galilee. And that's one of the things they accused Kepha of when Kepha was outside trying to watch to see what was going along in the trial. Are you not a Galilean? You're with the one that they're uh, trying in there. I can tell by your accent. It's the very same thing that gave Kepha and Yohanan and them away in Acts chapter 2 when the Jews who came from other countries came to observe Shavuot or Pentecost is, was their dialect. If Yeshua held the same dialect as Kepha, the Samaritan woman would have never accused him of being a, or recognized him as a Jew. She would have thought of him, him as a Galilean. So there was something about Yeshua that she knew immediately. Because he never identifies himself as a Jew until after she brings it up. So what did he look like? Do you look like that? I'm not saying you have to look like a Jew. But do you look like that people can look at you and say, I know what you are. And you know, some of them going to look at you and hate you. Some going to look at you and respect you. They might not agree. And others are going to love you. Ten men will grab a hold of a Jew and say, let us go up to the mountain of Yah with you. Those ten men are referring to the return of the ten tribes. Let us go up to the mountain with you to the house of Yah. The house of Yah is where you hear the Torah read. So, my covenant is based on the Torah of which Yeshua manifested physically 
with his life, with his words, and with the ultimate act that he carried out. You know, it's something we should always think about, especially if we claim that he's our Messiah, our Redeemer, our Savior, is. Do I hold what he did in contempt by thinking I can still live outside the covenant? May Yah bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. And may he give you shalom. Until the next time, shalom alaikum.